like to start by just thanking well, Pierre and, and the organizers because this place is awesome. And I would like to thank Jörg for his introductory lecture, which is, is awesome. So I'm really excited to be here, interact, and I expect to have a lot of um, So here is my, the outline of what I'm planning to do over the course of the next three lectures that I'm going to give. Um, so first of all, background. This is an AMO theory school. And I am not an AMO physicist, <laughs> nor am I a theorist. So <laughs> I wasn't a theorist. <laughs> no, but this is not a theory school. Oh, it's, it's just a school. It's okay. a school. Okay. So, 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 in some, so, in some sense, I'm okay. So even even so, so in some sense, I don't belong here, and that's no, you. That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the three lectures are going to look are, are going to look a little bit different from each other. Um, the first one is going to be this has a hook. Look at that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's one we ran over. Um, so <laughs> no, you, can, you can turn it around and then the hook will not work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Okay, so uh, the first one is going to be really a solid state physics. So um, the whole idea here is that we've already heard that MV centers and diamond are, are, are one of the systems that people are really interested in and excited about, and there's been a lot of work. Um, and coming here to this AMO school, I thought it would be valuable. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the system to learn the nitty-gritty details and a lot of those nitty-gritty details live in the in the Space that this is really these are really not actually atoms. And so we're going to talk about how uh, This is a really solid state system. By the way, who who here is a specialist already? Anyone? In what? MV centers, MV centers, diamond, <laughs> defects, anybody? My wife likes diamonds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, 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 anyway, uh, I, I want to know uh, which of you are going to come over. Okay, so, um, and then the next two lectures uh, reflect um, the, our, our previous uh, speaker's comment, which I thought was wonderful, uh, which is you can understand 95% of quantum mechanics if you understand a two level system and a harmonic oscillator. So everything else I'm going to talk about after after this one. So this first lecture is really the only important one because everything afterward is a two-level system and a harmonic oscillator. That's all it is. So, <laughs> and so basically, I, I, I thought about what I could do here. And by the way, we also have Paula Capillera coming, yeah. and she's going to give also diamond and V-center related talks. And so, uh, so I decided to really focus on the mechanics aspect um, of of this work. And so I'm going to give two lectures on the mechanics. And um, in the first one, I'm going to introduce kind of these spin phonon interactions um, in diamond and, and discuss some of the experiments and some of the theoretical proposals that are out there. And then in the second one, I'll continue um, particularly focusing on the spin strain interactions, um, which is what we do in my group and what a few of the other uh, researchers out there, like the Jai's group at UCSB, um, Patrick Matinsky's group um, in Basel is working on. And, and really try to focus on the experiments. And, and, and feel free to pump me for details about what might be the interesting next step, but I'm gonna restrain my comments to things that have already been out in the world. Um, okay, so this is a slide that I put on virtually every talk that I give on MV Centers and Diamond. Um, so I, I'm gonna give this, and then I'm gonna go into the details behind all of this as we go. So of course this is a defect in diamond, it's a point defect. People have been interested in point defects in diamond for 60 years. Um, they used to be called color centers. Uh, that, that means the ones, the point defects that have a fluorescent transition is really what that means. Um, here I've drawn it as a molecule instead of as a, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a defect. But it really is a defect inside of a crystal. So this pink thing over here, this is a, a missing carbon atom. So you have a, a lattice of tetrahedrally bonded carbon atoms. Um, these are dangling bonds. These black ball and stick things are carbon atoms with dangling bonds adjacent to that vacancy. And this blue ball with its little stick is a, a nitrogen atom with a dangling bond. And so you really um, can think about this as a molecular system. Okay, um, it's got a, number, a bunch of electrons. We're going to actually go through the molecular states, so uh, some of you are going to be crying uh, in, in your coffee cups shortly from boredom. But, but, but I think it's important to at least see that once. Um, and one of the nice things about it is that it's, it's a beautiful system for studying kind of sandbox quantum physics 
even though it's just experimentally very simple to work with. So first of all, you go get yourself a diamond, they're already in there. If you get yourself a really pure diamond, they're probably not in there, but you can put them in there. So it's really nice in that sense. You, you can sort of select how expensive you want to get as to how many you get. Um, and then all you have to do experimentally to like see if they're there is you just turn on a laser. The laser is just a green laser. It's the same color as this laser pointer that I'm holding. Okay? So it's nothing very fancy. It's interesting, actually, it's an interesting story as to why the green laser actually works, and I'll get to that. Um, but if you just shine in this green light and use a confocal microscope, which is now well-developed technology, you can actually isolate individual ones of these defect centers in the diamond. So, even at room temperature, with nothing special equipment, you can already see single quantum systems in a, in a solid system. Of course, you can work with one NV, or you can work with ensembles of NVs, and there's advantages to that we've already heard. Um, but actually, this is not the part that makes this system really interesting to people, and why it has become valuable. Um, what has made it valuable is this, which is the uh, sort of room temperature optical cycle of the MV center. Okay. So I'm going to walk through this again, and this is a kind of cartoon, and I will actually go through the details of this uh, later on in the talk. So the first thing to be aware is that it has an orbital degree of freedom, that its excitation is, is an optical transition, and it has a spin degree of freedom, and it's a, it's a spin one composite defect. Okay, So it's a spin triplet, and, and that spin triplet is in both the ground state and the excited state of, that, uh, of the levels connected by that, that orbital excitation. Okay? So, uh, so it's a spin triplet, but then what's, what that by itself is actually incredibly ubiquitous in solid state color centers. There's like all of them have some version of this. It's extremely common. What makes the MV center really interesting is this level right here. The most boring level of the whole system, which is a, which is a single level. And as you'll see, it's actually a little cascade of single levels. But the point is, it's a, it's a spin single level. It's doing exactly nothing, except it sucks population out of the minus one and plus one spin projection states at a different rate that it sucks it out of the zero. So it's a way of relaxing to the ground state, not giving off a photon, okay? And because it doesn't give off a photon selectively through particular spin levels, what that means is that when you measure the fluorescence of an NV center, the fluorescence depends on what the spin state is. So if the spin state is in the zero level, then you shine in your green laser and you count the red photons that come out of the system. You're just optically pumping the system. It's going up and down, up and down, and up and down. It spends about, each, each cycle, it spends about 10 nanoseconds in the excited state. It comes back down and gives off a photon, and you can just keep doing that over and over and over, lots of photons. If the spin projection happens to be minus one or plus one, then what happens instead is you get maybe one, maybe two of these optical cycles and then the rate for going into this singlet level over here is such that you'll get trapped over here. This guy has a longer lifetime. This is what people call a shelving state. And so it just sits there. And so you're optically pumping it, but you're not getting any light out. And so in this very simple way, if you just measure the fluorescence of an NV center, you know it's spins. And so that, that is the thing that makes it a really powerful system. It also is a handle that allows you to optically polarize the state. So even though you're at room temperature, even though um, the spin has uh, got an energy level splitting in the micro EV scale, and uh, KT is a thousand times bigger, okay, or something like that, then you still are able to cool this thing down to effectively micro Kelvin temperatures just by shining in the glass. So this sort of experimental simplicity has really been the key that's unlocked a lot of really interesting science in both the regime of metrology and in the regime of uh, quantum science. Okay, so I'd like to begin by just talking about how these semiconductor defects, and now I'm going to generalize for a little bit and not just talk about the NV center, but actually just the notion of a semiconductor defect. We'll call diamond a semiconductor for the case of this um, how a semiconductor defect is like an atom, what, what, what's the same? So first of all, if the, if the semiconductor is a wide band gap, diamond's five and a half EV, okay? So that's very wide um, in term, compared to the energy of optical frequency light. And, and you just pluck an atom out of that semiconductor, then the localized state are highly localized. So that makes it very atom-like. It's 
very protective. Um, in addition, um, you can have these optical dipole transitions of these color centers within this range where the photons that come in and out are not absorbed by the bands. So again, the semiconductor can behave as if it's a vacuum. It's just a place to hold the defect. Um, one of the nice things, as I'll show you in detail later, uh, these, these things can have useful polarization selection rules. So we can go open up our AMO textbook and we can learn nice tricks and we can just immediately apply them um, to these, these systems. Um, and like I said, the, the semiconductor defect can be vacuum -like. And, and there, there are things that break down about that, in particular with the spin part of the, of the, the uh, semiconductor. Now it turns out that, as we've seen, spin is a robust and coherent quantum degree of freedom. So even at room temperature, people have seen NV centers with like high-order decoupling sequences that are approaching second the electron spin. So it's just, it's just a star. Or sorry, that's, that's low temperature. Excuse me. Room temperature is <coughs> tens of milliseconds, but whatever. Yeah, it's extremely good. And um, you know, you actually can imagine lots of different kinds of systems where this type of uh, defect-based quantum system could be realized. So, of course, diamond, it's just carbon, but the periodic table is much larger than that. Um, so I want to talk about that for just a minute. Um, but, but first, let's talk about some of the differences, because these, this is where it becomes both interesting and um, and, and complicated. Um, so first of all, what are the differences? As I mentioned, you actually have a real <coughs> valence banding conduction band. So, so you actually have that there. And sometimes that's helpful and sometimes not. Um, the other thing is that the defect, which is surrounded by these atoms and is trapped by them, it sees their vibrations. So that's phonons. So that's, that it could be good or it could be bad. Um, one of the things is that most defects, almost all of them, have some type of frank condon effect. Who knows what a frank condon effect is? Okay, I'll just tell you. Yeah, okay, so, so basically, if you, I'll, I'll get into this detail later, but if you look at a, a diagram of the uh, orbital transition, you have something like this, where uh, the atom position, the equilibrium atom positions for the ground state and the excited state are different. And that leads to all sorts of interesting effects, um, but one of them is the creation of a photon absorption side band. Um, that means that that's actually the origin of why I can pump with higher energy photons and still have them be absorbed by the defect. Um, that's useful because it's convenient, but it also effectively limits the size of the electric dipole transition for um, kind of quantum optics. So for that type of thing, it's bad. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, and of course, the other thing is that it actually sees uh, the strain in the lattice, as we'll see um, in, in some of the later lectures. So the, the lattice strain, or stress if you prefer, actually comes into the energy levels of these defects, and so you can either work with that or you can be bothered by it. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that because this is a molecular system, symmetry of the defect in the lattice plays a central role in understanding the properties, and so I want to try to highlight that a little bit as we go through how an MD center works. Um, and then the other thing to think about is that these defects see a spin bath. So if we consider spin as our primary sort of quantum variable in the system, then <clears throat> the primary method of decoherence in most of these solid state systems is the fact that there are other spins around that we're not controlling, and that is what we call the spin bath. And that spin bath is composed of both electronic spins, other electronic impurities, meaning other electronic spins in the, in the lattice, and, and also uh, nuclear spins. Now we can usually clean up the electronic spins. They're usually from like dope and dams. So we can just get clean materials. But the nuclear spin is a little bit more pernicious because it's hard to get rid of them if it's the basic parts of the lattice. Now a material like carbon is really nice because most of the atoms are carbon-12. So we don't have to worry about those. There's still some carbon-13s in there. Okay. So this is kind of a, a, on balance. This is sort of like an AMO system. There's some atom-like, ion-like features here, and uh, there's some, some not. 
<clears throat> so why is this kind of become, I think it's worth thinking about the historical perspective on this, because this is a relatively new system, as we heard, ions have been around for many, many years. Um, I credit this kind of explosion of the NV Center to three, three things. The first one is the, the emergence of quantum information and the power of what it can do, um, really as demonstrated by other systems in a very nice way. Um, but then there's some experimental uh, things that came really into maturity within only the last 15 years, which is, are these single molecule methods. And you may know the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given for these single molecule method development um, just this past year. And then, of course, there really is, is uh, as far as I know, between silicon carbide and MV centers and diamond, um, it's the only game in town for room temperature quantum information processing. I guess ion traps and atomic systems, it depends on how you define it. Um, but the, the point is, is certainly in the solid state world, this is the only system that anybody knows about that can work at room temperature. And that, that actually has some real value. And I kind of credit uh, your Grok trip with really realizing all of this first, combining, he comes from the single molecule world, combining these ideas of single molecule methods and quantum information and a room temperature system so I think uh, we all owe him a debt of gratitude. Okay. Um, so, so you can see the history. Um, so I just pulled this off the web of science. This is just a simple search. And so people sort of were interested in, you know, diamond, color centers, MV centers, sort of da 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 These are all sort of very, you know, oh, look at this, isn't this neat? And then all of a sudden we get these two important PRLs of the Rock Trip group where they show that they can do um, high fidelity SR of NV center electronic spins and controlled knot rotations or controlled rotations from a carbon-13 nucleus and all of a sudden everyone went, holy cow, this is a really interesting system. And after that there was some kind of exponential growth curve. And, and I'm hoping that it kind of flattens out at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to move out. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Oh, okay, anyway. Not, yeah, exactly, exactly. So maybe that would be a population crash. You know? um, okay, so, so in terms of atom-like defect systems, this idea is fairly mature now in terms of the Nitrogen Vacancy Center, um, thanks in large part to a number of prominent groups, the Auchelon Group, the Rock Trip Group, the Lincoln Group at Harvard, and then of course now there's some second generation spin-offs of those groups, like mine. Um, and then, um, and then there's also a group of people trying to extend this field to look at different solid state materials, different uh, platforms for doing uh, this same kind of science in, in new defect systems. And so the, the most prominent one is the dye vacancy in silicon carbide. That was an idea that came out of a collaboration between uh, David Auchelon's group and uh, Chris Vanderwall's group, also both of them at UCSB at the same time. And it's a very nice thing, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that work in particular, but they've actually succeeded experimentally in identifying these things and really working with them. And in fact, um, within the last um, month, these are both still online. I don't think they're actually out in print yet. Um, there's been these two papers, one by the Rock Trip Group, one by the um, Ushalon Group, where they've succeeded in, in isolating individual silicon carbide defects, controlling them. What's that? We have also one. Oh, you have one. But that's was we apparently submitted a few weeks too late. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. It's somewhere on there. Okay, so, so I, it's, it's one of one of one of my young guys who did that. So okay. He did his own. So I think this is just beautiful. And so I mean, the point is that uh, th this is a sort of new area. Now there's other groups out there trying to find um, other materials. So in my group, we work on zinc oxide also. And there's only been a sort of very tiny number of papers, and it's not even as mature as the silicon carbide is. So there's, there's really a lot to think about. And I think that we'll see more of these systems emerging. Is zinc oxide also split here? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's about the same as diamond. So, so oxygen is essentially no No, yeah, but zinc? Zinc is about, uh, it's like 4%, but then you have all these oxygens in the denominator, so you end up with about 2%. Okay. Okay, so this is this paper by um, Van der Waal and Anshalom um, from back now 2010, so actually four years ago, five years ago. Um, and they really kind of laid down 
what it is that you're looking for. And this is a key point. So um, what do you need to identify a system that could act like an MV center? So um, first of all, what do you need for the semiconductor host? You need it to be a wide band gap because what you want is to have optical transitions that don't involve the bands. That's an important ingredient. Um, they identify that you want relatively small spin orbit coupling. Um, that's a critical ingredient because you don't want thermal vibrations, thermal phonons, to totally decohere the spin. Okay? So if you want to have a room temperature type system, then it should couple at most weakly to the lattice um, in terms of the spin. Now, of course, you want just the practical aspect. You want to be able to get a good quality sample of that material, ideally in single crystal form, because then you have good control over your substrate. And finally, this, this very critical element here, which is that the elements in the semiconductor are ideally have nuclear spins of zero, or at least are, you can isotopically separate out and, and create uh, spin zero, because those are the things that deface the spins of these semiconductor defects. Okay, so what do you need to actually have a qubit out of a defect like this? Well, first of all, you need a bound state, like an MV center. You need something that's tightly bound. And it has to have some state that's useful as a cube, probably a spin. Um, you want an optical pumping cycle that can do the thing that an MV center does, which is polarize the spin and hopefully read it out as well. Um, so that's the third one, is some, some type of way of reading out the spin state. Luminescence is the obvious way, um, but maybe there's other ways. Maybe there's some polarization selection or something along those lines. Um, and then, of course, uh, you need to have bound states that are, that are distinguishable to avoid thermal excitation between them. And it's actually a relatively straightforward list of things. And so that's the reason why we, these are pretty easily achievable. And that's the reason why I think we'll see more of these um, in the future. OK, I'm trying to advance this slide. All right, there we go. OK, so now what I want to do is focus. Um, I want to focus on the MV center in diamond, um, and I want to tell you where <coughs> the properties of an optical cycle come from. Um, so we're going to start at the very beginning, and we're going to think like a chemist here, because this, this, is, this is what we have to do. They kind of invented all of this theory, um, and then we, we just go and, and, you know, Marcus Doherty and Jerome Mays just kind of went through the careful molecular orbital theory, and then we just read about it and, and write it. <coughs> okay, so, um, so, so how do you get to this, these properties of an MV center in diamond? So first of all, you have diamond, you have uh, valence band and conduction band, uh, but then you have this localized state. Um, there's four dangling bonds, right, because there's four atoms around the vacancy. Um, three of those dangling bonds are from carbon atoms, okay? One of them is from a nitrogen atom. Now, these carbon dangling bonds are sort of natively populated each with one electron. The nitrogen is natively populated with two. It's a lone pair, as the chemist would say, right? And then you, it's actually the state that people are interested in is the negatively charged state of the MV center. So uh, you get one extra electron from the environment somewhere. And then you go to molecular orbital theory and group theory to figure out what happens next. So you write down these uh, states by just symmetrizing it with the C3V symmetry of the MV center. Um, and I'm not going to walk you through this in exact detail, but you, you can you know, write down these references, and it's all explained in there. Um, and you end up with these states. So what you have is, uh, so you have basically, you have four bonds, and you have four states, and then you fill them up with the electrons, the six electrons that are there. Now one of them is actually below uh, the valence band, so it doesn't really contribute. And in fact, these two bottom A levels, we call it A1 and A1 prime, are actually a mixture of the A1N and the A1C dangling bonds. Okay, so uh, th this kind of comes out of ab initio calculations. Then you have these next E symmetry, and I'll show you what I mean by E symmetry in a minute. And they each have one electron according to the rules. So that, that is. Um, the essential, that's what a ground state MV center looks like. Okay, so we, we, we get our spin triplet from that Hunt's rule. So we only worry about these states that are within the conduction band, and 
uh, we, we have to fill up A1, and then we put one electron in each of the two E symmetry orbitals. So that means that the ground state is an orbital singlet. That means there's only one orbital state in the ground state. That's actually a good thing. Now, it, it might be simpler to think about this in terms of the holes. So you can just flip this thing upside down, and you can say, oh, instead of adding in four electrons, I can add in two holes. That's, th those are totally equivalent. Um, then to get the excited state, in the electron picture, what you do is you promote one of the electrons, okay? So you still have a spin one, it's just a different set of electrons and a different set of orbitals. And, um, or in the whole picture, you just promote one of the holes, okay? That's, that's essentially um, what's going on. So now here is a picture of actually what these dangling bond symmetrized molecular orbital states look like. So here's the A1 state, and then EX and E1. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I am not going to bore you with this, because again, you can just go look this up. Um, but you can just write down exactly now all of the different states of the MV center. You use a Slater determinant, as you've all learned in quantum mechanics, to find the kind of molecular configuration states. Um, it's actually still fairly straightforward, and now you're going to start to recognize some of the terminology that people <laughs> use. So, first of all, there's this triplet A2, this is really just this ground state electron configuration that I mentioned earlier, okay? And the triplet means it's, it's a spin triplet, and, the, and then the A2 is just telling you about the symmetry of the state and then it's an orbital signal. Um, and then the excited state is this triplet E, so now it, E is telling you that there's, it's, it's a doublet, so there's two degenerate orbital states, and the, the degeneracy just comes from, you can have a sing, single electron over on the EX, or it could be on the EY. That's basically what it is. Okay? That's fine. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, so, that, so then now we can write down all the states. So we have, uh, these are the, the composite states of the, of the full particle with all the electrons involved. Um, so we have the ground state, which is a, a, a orbital singlet and a spin triplet. We have the excited state, which is an orbital doublet in a spin triplet. So there's six states up here, there's three states down here total. Um, and then these guys are the spin triplets that I referred to, the spin singlets that I referred to earlier. And these do not have a dipole connection, dipole transition connection to this uh, triplet A and, and, and triplet A, A2 state. So how did this state decay to this dark state? How did, how did this go? Yeah, to you here? said it's a dark. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So it's, uh, it's, it's what they call inter-system crossing. It's like way second or third or fourth order. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a, a primary dipole transition. And it's in the microwave, or why is it a um, transition? Uh, oh, you, you know, it's actually an open question, although I think that there's a paper by the Lucan group that recently established it, exactly what the energy difference is between this state and this state. Uh -huh. There's like a paper on the archive that came out a few weeks ago uh -huh. where they say that they've established that. And, and I haven't really okay. drilled through it as carefully as I need to, but that's... But don't you see that in the, like fluorescence when... No, These don't, don't appear in fluorescence. So you can't directly, oh, yeah, yeah, you can't directly probe the transition. Um, there actually is a fluorescence that you can see as it relaxes from this one to this one, and then back to here, and that's in the infrared, and people have observed that. But okay, so um, that was my question. Yeah, so it goes from because here the energy to here. has to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So there is right. a dipole term from E1, one E2, three so E2. So I mean, this is a phonon mediated relaxation. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 Not really. It's non radiated So from triplet, yeah, so from this excited state to this singlet state, it's a phonon mediated, non radiated relaxation. Okay. This one, there's radiation, but it's, people have said that it's not, it's not like got a high quantum efficiency, okay? And then this one, this final relaxation is presumably also not radiated. But I mean, this, this just underscores it's actually not, there's still open questions. There's still open questions about this extremely well-studied system. So I think... states by how much of that known? You mean in the optical excitation? Yeah, the op I have a paper on that. 
Yeah. Uh, so as far as we know, the optical excitation between the ground state and the excited state preserves the spin state perfectly. Yeah. Up to our, uh, you know, like fidelity of our microwave pulses is preserved perfectly. So what we did was we repaired a superposition state here and then, and then measured it up here, you know, like excite and then measured up here, did the kind of a tomography experiment, and we find its fidelity is as close to one as we can with the machine. So it doesn't seem to matter. Okay, all right, so, so we're back to this picture. And I want to just point out now, when you see people talking about this, um, it's really this, here's your uh, 3A, here's your 3E, here's your singlets, here's your, your readout. Um, a couple of things to know. Now, first thing is that there's a, a couple of fluorescence features that we'll get to in a minute. You have the zero phonon line, which is 1.945 EV. That's the direct non-phonon mediated <coughs> transition between the orbital ground state and the orbital excited state. This Frank-Hahnemann effect gives rise to a phonon sideband for both absorption and emission. So you can excite over a range of around 2 to 2.6 EV, and you relax over a range of around 1.9 to 1.6 EV. Okay? Um, this is what people call an intersystem crossing, which is this phonon-mediated dark relaxation. And um, you know, sometimes people talk about how you like, oh, optically polarize the spin. All of the experiments that have quantified this optical polarization uh, put it at around 85 to 95 percent. We did uh, an experiment like that when I was in the Oshlon group. We got around, I think it was 85. Other people put this number differently. I think it does depend actually on the particular NV center. Um, there was a nice paper in Ronald Hansen's group a few years ago where they quantified every single rate here. So if you actually want to know about these rates, it, it's really some, a good resource to look up. By the way, one of the common misconceptions is that that they kind of clearly uh, root out is that when you relax from the singlet state, I've heard many talks where people say it just goes into the spin zero state. That does not seem to be true. It goes with equal probability into the spin triplet. It's just the fact that you repeat the cycle and probabilistically depopulate minus one and plus one leads to the spin polarization. And that's the reason why you don't get a unity optical pumping efficiency for the electronic spin. Okay, um, a little bit more on phonon sidebands. This, yeah. Sorry, I just was trying to clarify that slide and the one before it. So the one before it, what does A one E cubed mean? What is that? Okay, so so wait. Uh, <coughs> left. Oh, the, these yeah. guys. Yeah. So the, this is telling you about the electron configuration. So it's the so this is like. Um, if you think back to your like you know freshman chemistry when they're like you know you have an atom you have like you know uh, s2 uh, 1s2 2s2 blah 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 that's the, the, that is the same thing it's the it's the electron configuration in terms of molecular orbitals okay and the spin degree of freedom in the next slide isn't in here the plus one minus one and zero. Isn't isn't in here? Is, is it in here? It is not. Okay. It, 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 this is only orbital. Where is this? Okay. So why? So the so the, the, the triplets are, are telling you that those are spin triplets, but it's not distinguishing their energy. Okay. So th this is just saying they're degenerate. It's actually not true, of course, but this is an EV scale, and the spin splitting is a micro EV scale. Okay. So why are they tri spin triplets? They are spin triplets because of this. <laughs> so, so it's just the fact that you have two electrons. So you just do orbital angular momentum addition, and you get a spin triplet from two. Hun's rule says that these two have to point in the same direction. Okay. So you have a total spin of one. Okay. And that's a spin triplet. Can I ask you? Yeah. Okay. So this singlet, uh, this only is there in the orbital ground state, and there's no equality on the upper. The, the, these singlets are actually a metastable singlet, so they're not the ground state. The ground state is this no, no, one. Saying, like, these dashed lines go to only the orbital ground state? Yes, that's right. And uh, like, is there another of the, the, these things hanging up there? Uh, there, there? This one's in the, people say this one is probably in the uh, conduction band. 
but but it's the relaxation from this one to this one that we were discussing earlier. This this phonon, it's intersystem crossing thing, and it's apparently it's fiendishly difficult to calculate exactly where that comes from. But again, I think there's a paper out that um, if you look at the archive from the Lincoln Group, they they have something out recently. Um, okay. These are great questions, yeah. What, what, is, what is responsible for the spinning of the doublet? Ah, so the, du the, the orbital doublet? Yes. So the orbital doublet is um, degenerate if you have C3V symmetry. In other words, you have an unstrained lattice. And if you add an electric field or a strain to the lattice, then you lower C3V, if it's transverse to the symmetry axis. And then you split, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but there's no, the doublet is not present in the final doublet. So, so, so I wanted to, yeah, this is a point I want to make before I go further. So this is effectively the room temperature optical cycle of an MV center. And it's very important to distinguish between the room temperature and the low temperature. How am I in time? Am I just running my over? So how much time do you need to finish this lecture on a, on a, in a reasonable way with questions? I mean, we are pretty flexible, you know? Okay. We have no place to go, right? All right, so, so I, have a, I have a part at the end that I can excise, so I think I should get to the low temperature stuff, okay. and then... Yeah, and, and then have questions. You can just kind of go like, me. okay, I'll pass over that, so... Well, I mean, if you, if you find that there's a natural break, you can break it, and then... I can add it later. Yeah, that's right, right. okay. All right, so let's, let's go on. Um, so I want to talk about the phonon absorption a little bit. Um, so this is also something that is ubiquitous for color centers in any solid state um, system. The fact that you just have a different uh, energy level that depends on the positions of the atoms, they call that the configuration coordinate. So that you, if we get a linear system, if you just had a chain of atoms, that would just be like x, the separation between the atoms. But if you have a real three-dimensional lattice, then it's something more complicated, okay? But um, typically, people find a way to, to plot it on a linear scale, and then you have a kind of quadratic energy dependence as you, maybe it's a breathing mode of the atom, something like this. Um, and, and essentially, this, this effect is from the fact that the, the, the orbitals exert fields onto the nuclei. Right? The electrons exert fields under the nuclei, and so when you promote an electron from the ground state to the excited state, it, its equilibrium position is different, and that's why it's a ubiquitous effect. And so then this, this means that you have different energies for absorption and emission. Yeah? Sorry, I'm making progress. <coughs> it's well, okay. There's two fat parabolas. So yeah. what, are, what do those correspond to in your diagram in the previous slide? So uh, these would be the energy level of the orbital states, the like say, a, the yeah, that, that, e to the squared and a one e cubed, something. Those yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yes, exactly. And, and those things depend on those atomic positions, and so you have this type of uh, situation, and it gives rise to this fluorescence, and the it's, fluorescence. That's the atomic position of the, the carbon around the plus and hydrogen. Yeah, um, the atoms around the around, around the MV center. So, so you typically what? Thing. Yeah, that's right. So typically, it depends on the defect. And uh, I have a, a reference at the very end. Um, there's a very good book by um, oh, it's in the slide. Uh, it's like from 1975, but it, it's a wonderful book and it explains all of this stuff in just great detail. If you have a question, I can sure. and, and so the. Uh, this energy difference between 1a and 3e is actually much, much larger than what you showed in the slide because it's the difference essentially between those two. Right, and, 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 and these little these little ladders, these are the, the, the phonon yeah, yeah, vibrational, yeah. vibrational levels, right. exactly, of, of, of the, these yeah. different systems. And also like the orbital and spin splittings are in there too. Right? They're in there, but yeah. one of the nice things about in centers is the spin splittings don't depend very much. They depend only a little bit on, on on these vibrational levels, and thus. By depends, like you mean that there's a coupling. So, like once I do the LS coupling, then so each of these parabolas is after the LS coupling or before the LS coupling. Um, what I'm saying is the LS coupling is so small you don't see it on this picture on this scale. Uh -huh. Yeah. What is the figure? 
facing with the federation or is it the controller? It's eight, it's three gigahertz. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's gigahertz. So it depends exactly on the diamond lattice, just the frequency of, of uh, it's actually like, you could just relate it to the speed of sound in diamond. Because, because the electron wave functions don't overlap as much in, in the defect compared to that. That's right. That's, no, right. that's why the, the nuclear spin coupling is so weak to the diamond chain. That's, that's also true. Because the electron wave functions are mostly in the, in the empty. Yes, that's right. Except in the excited state. Except very, in the end. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so, so you can do a fluorescence experiment like this one, and you can see at low temperature a very sharp line, and that is the um, zero field, or sorry, the, the zero photon line, and that is the direct transition between the equal vibronic levels of the, of the two states, the excited state and the ground state. And then um, on the red side of that, you're going to get the emission band, and on the blue side of that, you're going to get the absorption band. Um, so this is a practically so an experimental value. Like problem with, with numbers, so it how many of these vibrational levels are populated? Uh, that's a great question. A 10 what is 3 gigahertz oh, in 10? Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. 3 gigahertz is 3, 3 gigahertz, 150, uh, 150 millikelvin. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're, uh, still, they're uh, still popular. This is, this is, one, 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 yeah, so when you do a low temperature measure, you still see wanted, these phonons. You have wanted to say something. No, but these, these phonons, I mean, they're, they're basically all in the ground. You relax very fast in the ground. Yes, you do. Because, because the thermal excitation of the first phonon, if you're cold, is very, very small. And 10K is basically zero. Well, that was my question. Yeah. Yes. The, the, the diamond is so stiff, that's I think was one of the, yeah. the really, really nice things. The diamond is so stiff that these frequencies are extremely high. Yeah, Ten K is nothing compared to the compared to the separation. Yeah. Okay. I mean, room temperature is twenty-five million. I don't know these things. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, that's why you. So, so that's why I'm the theorem. Twenty-five million volts is that. That's room temperature. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But it's, okay. but it's still bigger than the space. It's room temperature. But it's it's like it's it's so the other thing to be aware of is that we can know separation level. You just said it's 3 gigahertz. No, no, no. So that's much more. That's that's whatever. Uh, 100 milliliter volts or something. That's about 1,000 Kelvin. And that's two of these letters. Which are yeah. Okay. So, so one thing to be aware of is that you can have <coughs> phonons emitted and phonons absorbed. So these effects are important even at zero temperature. Right, right. So this is like pair pair production, or this is two mode stuff. So I'm oh, sorry, I skipped an important point. Somehow, <laughs> there we go. Here it is. Um, the other thing is that I, I touched on this briefly earlier, but. That one of the impacts of having this type of a structure <coughs> is that the effective dipole moment is lower. Um, so if you want to compute, say, for example, the optical Rabi frequency, so if you take a coherent laser and you put it on the orbital transition, and you want to compute the optical Rabi frequency, it is uh, related to uh, the Debye-Waller. The Debye-Waller factor is essentially um, limiting the, the, the strength of that transition, and it is around 0.04 in particular for NV centers and diamond, and that's essentially just given by the number of photons um, that go into the zero photon line compared to the rest. And if you just look at this picture, you can see right away, most of them go into the phonon side band. And so that really is a downside of, in particular, the NV center. Um, and, and, and it is, in fact, a truth that different color centers, based on their structure, have different uh, coupling in this way. In other words, these, these parabolas might be better lined up. And that would give you a, a, a better, higher Debye-Waller factor. And so, for example, the silicon vacancy center has a much smaller phonon sideband, and that has actually motivated a lot of the recent excitement about the silicon vacancy center inside in, in Diamond, which has maybe not as nice spin properties, but it's uh, di it's, it's, it's optical dipole coupling is, is better in some sense. Okay, um, so now I want to talk about the fine structure of the ground state spin. 
Um, so this is what I would normally talk about in the talk because I almost one question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know how much is that non-radiative transitions in the NB? What's the fraction of it? You mean what is the quantum efficiency? Yeah. I do not. Um, I guess also the silicon vacancy. There was also a question. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know the answer. People have um, estimated it, and I'm not an expert on this. So it's a good question, and I don't have the right answer. But some people have said it's unity, some people have said it's not unity. I don't think it's super low, but I don't know that it's one. Bad answer. Um, okay, so let's move on to the spin. Yeah? Just to clarify, this is that bottom 3A2 spin triple. That's exactly right, yeah. So, so when I talk about the ground state electron spin, I'm talking about the orbital ground state. And so even if I'm talking about <coughs> excitations of the spin, the spin has, you could call it an excited state in the ground state because it is up and down and so on. Um, but but I'm, I'm mainly talking about ground state in my parlance means orbital ground state. Um, okay, so this is the Hamiltonian. You can't come and talk about hybrid quantum systems without writing down Hamiltonian. Turns out that this Hamiltonian is totally ubiquitous for any spin greater than one system. It's just a question of what the size of these numbers are, okay? Um, so there's sort of color-coded here, there's three terms to think about. I'm showing this to you in whichever way you like best. I can write it out, like this guy on the top. This matrix shows it to you in a formalism in the basis of plus one, zero, and minus one spin projection. And then here's just a plot of the energy eigenstates of these spin levels. There's a function of magnetic field applied along the axial, along the symmetry axis, of the defect. And so what you can see is actually this shows you directly why this is a useful system. So the first thing is these red terms, these D zeros, this is the zero field splitting. It is lifting the degeneracy of the zero and the minus one spin states at zero magnetic field. And it turns out this guy is a very convenient value of around three gigahertz. And it depends on the positions of the atoms. So if you change the temperature of the diamond, the lattice of the diamond <coughs> changes, and it shows up as a small shift of this thing. And so it turns out that people have used this fact to make NV centers very sensitive thermometers. And that's a kind of interesting uh, uh, quantum metrology that you can use NV centers for. And this D naught is easy to measure? Yeah, it's, it's just an ESR transition. And I'm going to do experimental details later, but yes, it's very easy to measure. Um, and I'm sure Paolo will talk even more detail than me. Okay, so then the next one is the Zeeman splitting. So it's just got the, the um, you know, general magnetic ratio of a free electron, 2.8 megahertz per Gauss. So of course it's a good field sensor. And then uh, the strain splitting. So this one is by far the tiniest term. Because in principle, if this thing is exactly C3V, this term would be zero, okay? Um, if there's an electric field or there's any lattice strain in the diamond, then this thing becomes non-zero, and it has two effects. The first effect is that it um, comes in longitudinally. That is if you squish along the axial direction, if you bring the, the N and the V closer together. And that just shifts D0. It just adds right in. It's got the same symmetry. Um, this is a little confusing, and I apologize. Uh, but the notation here, note that, that, that sigma x is not the Pauli matrix, sigma x. Sigma x, sigma is also for a, for a stress, is the, is the symbol that people use. So epsilon is the coupling <coughs> coefficient, and sigma is the, is the stress uh, variables, and the, you know, the, the, the diagonal term of the stress tensor. Yes, What's that? S S S yeah, so here I'm using S, X, S, Y, and S, Z as the, as the, as the spin matrix elements. Okay. And it's sigma Z, X, and Y are they? So this is like stress along the X, Y S coordinates S of the, the defect, yeah. And, and these two both end up, so, you know, this, this term here in the off diagonal, I've only included one of these. So the other one would come in with like a, an I. But essentially it's the same thing. Um, and they couple together minus one plus one. So zero magnetic field, what this perpendicular stress coupling does is it lifts the degeneracy between minus one and plus one and creates the states to be plus and minus, just symmetrized versions. 
Now, if you apply a large magnetic field to go back into the Zeeman basis, it's still there. It just doesn't very much shift the energy level of these spins. So, um, so uh, if I look at the just behind you, you yeah. have some, some, some number, and it seems to be a fraction of a hertz. Yeah, it's teeny. So it's do, teeny you, do you need to worry about it at all? Uh, it's the whole basis for microbes experiments. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, a Pascal is a very small pressure. So yeah, yeah, for a diamond, though. Wait, because yeah, we, we, can, we can put in, like, tens of megapascals okay. of stress. Right. So and then it ends up being, like, big megahertz. Mega hertz, okay. Yeah. Where, where's the last one going? So these two are just different symmetries. They end up to be one convenient way to rewrite this. You could write this in terms of s plus and s minus. Okay. And then these would come together with some like phase factor, and you get like s plus, s plus, plus s minus, s minus type thing. OK. Um, <clears throat> now, I've completely ignored, so I, yeah. Sorry, why does the perp uh, part of the, uh, or where? Oh, right, right, right. So be perpendicular, this guy, it would, it would just be, so this would be a, a magnetic field applied not along the symmetry axis. It would be applied along any axis perpendicular to the, to the axial symmetry of the defect. Is that? And, I mean, it seems like it's very present in your Hamiltonian. Why, isn't, why aren't the energies a function of it? Okay, so... Um, because it does not add linearly with the zero field splitting, if you apply a big field along the perpendicular direction, you have some funny shifting of the levels and you mix up the spin states. It, you can do it, it works fine, but it's, it's practically less useful. So what people typically do is they apply a, a magnetic field along the symmetry axis of the defect to establish Zeeman spin states. And then the purpose of this thing is you put make this an AC term and you use it for magnetic resonance. So that energy chart has the Hamiltonian would be perfect equal to zero. In this chart, it would be zero. Okay. Yes. Is, is this a good place to to break? Are you? Um, yeah, I'm just worried. Are, are we running out of time? time? Yeah. Well, I'm just worried that lunch is going to. I you know I cannot stand between people. Well, there, no, the point is that there is one more lecture before lunch. I understand. Let's stop. Let, let's break. Is it a good place to stop? Because if you think that another view graph or two is a better place to stop, um, <coughs> uh, I think I think I can skip slides. Let me see. All right. Maybe I'll. Well, I want I want to talk about this briefly. Just okay. Very briefly. Um, so one of the things, and this goes to an earlier question. One of the things that I haven't talked about is the spectroscopy of the orbital states at low temperature. And I'm going to skip, but if you try to do this at room temperature, it doesn't work. And the physics is actually very interesting, but there's no way that we're going to just... This has been a wonderful discussion, but we just have run out of time. Um, so this is some nice work out of a number of different groups. Um, here I'm showing some work out of the rock trip group where essentially they do an experiment that's known as PLE, which stands for photoluminescence excitation. And what they do is they use a narrow frequency band tunable laser, and they try to resonantly get absorption on the zero phonon line depending on the, on the different spin structures. So you can see the real fine structure. Okay? And what you can see when you do that is, first of all, um, these, these transitions, in fact, do conserve spin. Um, and the other thing that comes out very nicely from this, and this is, this is, this is like a heroic plot, um, is that, as you can see directly how the orbital degeneracy of those two, of the, those double levels in the excited state is lifted as, as a strain um, goes into the local environment. And so it, this is a perpendicular strain. And it just shifts and you have um, two branches, uh, one you call EX and one you call EY. Um, and, and actually, um, we heard earlier about like lambda system physics and, and some things like that. And, and this is the sort of, th these kind of effects actually couple to the optical selection rules that enable that kind of low temperature lambda system physics. Um, so actually, um, you have sort of two different regimes that are interesting. The first one is um, at, at low magnetic field and uh, zero strain. 
uh, you have one sort of thing, and the other one is you can apply a field and or you can apply a string. Um, so th this is the thing that I wanted to get to before I finished. Okay. So um, if you do these kinds of experiments, you can get to two important dipole selection rules for low temperature, um, coherent <laughs> orbital uh, effects to do lambda physics um, between the ground state and the excited state. And one, this was uh, a, a one identified by the Lucan group, where they couple this A2 level of the excited state manifold um, with uh, the uh, ground state. These are the spin plus one, or actually the spin plus and the spin minus. Uh, this is a zero magnetic field. Uh, spin plus and spin minus of the, of the ground state. That's this. And this is the this, this this A2 level, okay? And it turns out that if you go through this very carefully, when you have a system into this, if you excite into this A2 level and wait for a relaxation, the photon that comes out of the zero phonon line has got left circular uh, polarized light if it goes to the plus spin state, and right circular polarized light if it goes to the minus spin state. And so that's a beautiful way to set up a lambda system. Um, the other thing that you can do is have a diamond that has a high stress. And um, if it has a large stress and you're split into these um, EX and EY symmetry branches, then you have a different uh, selection rule. And that is you get linearly polarized light, depending on uh, if you get relaxation or absorption into this branch, you get X-oriented linear polarized light, and Y oriented linear polar right than the other one. And there's lots more interesting stuff, but obviously I'm out of time, so thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much.